Um, thank you for joining us for the pre-application technical assistance webinar for the Collaborative Research Center for American Indian Health, also known as CURBA. My name is Danielle Kenyon, the, and I'm the program director for CURBA. Um, the focus of this uh, webinar, and I'm in the um, administrative core, is to really support and develop more research on social determinants of health for American Indian health in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. So this presentation is being recorded for future use. These slides will be available on our website for future reference at www.crcaih.org. Um, you may must sign into the webinar and call the telephone line that is listed on this slide um, as well as in the chat box. Currently, we will have everyone on mute or lecture mode. And whenever you have a question, please type it into the question box. Uh, we'll pause in the middle for questions and at the end, uh, but feel, so feel free to type in your questions into the text box at any time. Uh, we won't be unmuting the mic for questions at the end. We'll just be taking questions through the question box. Joining me today is Tabitha Lundke. She is the Grant Development Manager here at Sanford Research in the Grants Office. So the overall purpose of the CURBA Pilot Grants Program is to fund cutting-edge transdisciplinary research that addresses the significant health disparities experienced by American Indians in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota. So that's really taking a collaborative approach and designing re and implementing research projects that come up with a new methodology across disciplines. All of these projects that are funded through the pilot grants program will embrace the social determinants of health and leading to the improvement of American Indian health. So that's where we're looking at the environmental and social aspects that have an impact on health. And also another thing these projects should do is have a strong potential for future funding, including the sustainability and growth of the project. So where we're seeing this, um, these successful awardees is these pilot grants are really seed money to help them get their program of research off the ground that will lead to more research in the future. So this slide is just showing, um, as many of you have hopefully seen on our website, that curva.org slash pilot grants. The RFA and application are the two big pieces of information with all of the, the information you'll need to apply for the pilot grant. Um, the RFA is on the, on the left, and that is the PDF document that has all of the information and overview of what goes into the application, different resources for you to consider, and we'll be going through um, all of those things today. The document on the right of the slide is the, um, a picture of the front page of the application. This is the Word document that we'd like you to type your um, responses in and um, fill out. So they're you cutting and pasting different information into this document. So just to go over the eligibility for the pilot grants program, we um, are open, very open to any organization that can receive federal funding. So this includes community and tribal organizations, businesses, local government, schools, um, higher education institutions, advocacy organizations, state and regional organizations, anybody who's available and eligible to uh, receive federal funding. So the applicants were, we don't have any specific degree doesn't necessarily need to be a PhD who is the principal investigator or PI. Um, we're looking for any individual with the skills, knowledge, and resources necessary to be the PI of the project. So investigators may participate in more than one application per cycle, but to not be involved as the principal investigator or that lead or co-PI in more than one project. So the PIs um, are also um, eligible since this is our third round of the pilot grants. Anyone who has an active CURPA award are not eligible. So an overview of the project timeline. Um, we're really excited that this is our third year of the pilot grant cycle. Um, we have already kicked it off. We've kind of pushed it earlier and earlier every year just so that we 
have more time between um, when the applications are due. They could be awarding more time for review and an age review and uh, more time to get secure those um, IRB uh, materials. So this year we have a letter of intent, which is not uh, mandatory, but highly encouraged. That is due on December 15th. So if you didn't um, turn in an LOI, that's just fine. Um, you are still free to apply. We very encourage you to do so. Um, but the big red um, text is the most important that you want to look at. That application deadline is February 10th of this year. So we have a little less than a month now to work on those applications. So we're looking at um, the review will happen after that. We have an external review process. And the notification of awards will happen probably sometime mid-April of 2015. And the funding period for this grant will be starting August 1st um, for one year. And then just a, a bit of a funding overview. What we have um, dedicated to this, um, this for this year is um, $240,000 in direct cost. Um, what we're looking at, we're looking for applications that have um, between $25,000 and $80,000 in direct cost. And these grants, there's um, an FNA rate is allowed at your institution's approved rate um, over and above that amount. So writing projects that fit $25,000 to $80,000. So this year, um, another change, and all of this information is on um, page 5 of the RFA, that PDF document. Or, I'm sorry, um, I believe it's page 3. That um, our tribal partners with the Community Engagement and Innovation Division um, came up with some research priorities. And in those are in three broad areas of mental health, diabetes, health and nutrition, and tobacco. And a lot of the projects, um, we have some example projects in the RFA. What we're looking for is um, when testing out interventions, what are some policies that can be implemented? How can we improve um, those um, health conditions and how do those conditions interact? An evaluation of the proposals, all of the proposals, as I said, the, we have an external review process. These are the criteria that those external reviewers will be looking at. So again, going back to the scope of purpose, those, um, the purpose that I stated right away at the beginning. Is, um, is the scope of the project reasonable? Does it fit that one year timeline? Um, is it based on solid scientific methodology and rationale? And is there a solid plan in place for meeting the objectives? The reviewers will be looking at if the project is innovative um, and does it have, again, that strong potential for future funding, future research? How can this be used as a um, jumping off point for more projects? They'll be looking at the projects and looking at um, if there will be an effective use of requested resources. So is the budget appropriate for the things that are, are being asked for? And is that enough for the likelihood of will the project be successful due to that um, environment, the investigators that are involved? And then again, does the project meet a high standard of community-based participatory research and tribal participatory research standards with a high level of commitment from partners. And then again, um, we have the many core and division resources that um, are there to help everyone with their application. So just as an overview of Kirka, we have an administrative division that I'm a part of. We have a valuation there as well that is available to help you with those types of questions. The Community Engagement and Innovation Division, Culture Science and Bioethics Core that um, can help reflect on if your project is culturally appropriate. We have a methodology core um, that is pretty popular in designing projects that can help look at your design and see um, if the statistics that you're planning to use are appropriate. And we have a regulatory knowledge core that can help with the human subject section and um, talking through different approvals that might be necessary. And we also have a webinar detailing all of these services um, on our website. So 
for more information on what these cores and divisions do, we have a lot of information on our website, or please feel free to email us or call for more information. All right. At this point, I'll ask if there's any questions um, that people have typed in. Yeah, it looks like we have a couple questions to look at. Um, the first one is, in order to budget for indirect costs, do we need to have a current year 2015 indirect cost rate, or will Kirka accept a fiscal year 2014 rate as a provisional rate? We will accept the provisional rate if you don't have a current rate available. Whatever your most um, recent rate approved at your institution is the rate we will accept. Next question is, if I started the LOI, would you still like it submitted or shall I just work on the project? Um, I think you'd be better spent, um, your time would be better spent just working on the project. Um, it, we would encourage you to connect with us so that we can have a chat and see if there's any additional resources that we can offer you. So if you haven't been in touch with anyone of the Kirka team, we, um, I would encourage you to email or call and we'll get you connected with anyone that can help out. But at this point, um, spending time on the LOI, um, we would encourage you just to spend that time on the application. Another question is, can I write info at kirka.org to ask about methodology of my application? Of course you can write um, info at kirka.org. They will probably transfer your question to one of the methodology team members. So um, always going to info at kirka is a great way to go. Otherwise, um, everyone, every one of the cores and divisions has a contact person in the RFA on page 5. So whichever way you want to go, we'll get you to the right person. It looks like we have one more at this point, and that's, can community-based organizations that have a fiscal agent apply? Yes. And if you have any questions about if your fiscal agent is appropriate or if they um, are able to receive federal funds, please call us. Um, the grants office contact is on the um, back page of the RFA, um, so it doesn't hurt to check if you have a question. And I think that's all the questions for now, so I'm going to turn off, uh, turn over uh, the mic <laughs> to Tabitha Lemke from our research grants office. As Danielle said, I am the grant development manager for Sanford Research. Um, I helped with the development of the application and the RFA. Um, Rhonda Hinch in our office is a grant coordinator, and she is actually the grants office contact for this grant program. Um, but I, too, would be happy to answer any questions related to it. Um, Rhonda's information is provided on the RFA and at the end of the slides as well. Um, I'm going to just do a walkthrough of the application components and answer any related questions. Um, please remember to type your questions into the question box at any time and we'll get to those at the um, end of the discussion here. Um, and first off I just want to mention there are some formatting requirements and those are on page 6 of the RFA. So I'm not going to go through those in detail, but make sure that you do abide by those formatting requirements. The application package, the Word um, document, is set up to meet those requirements currently. So the first page of the application package is the cover sheet. Um, this provides the basic institutional and um, principal investigator information for the application. Um, the proposal title must not be more than 200 characters. Um, including spaces and word, um, including spaces between words and the punctuation. And please be sure to check if your application is new or revised. And if it is a revised, if you've previously submitted this application to the um, Kirka Pilot Grants, please include that date so that we can reference that application as well if needed. Um, under the applicant organization, it's important that we completely fill out that information. It is federal requirements that we have those details, so if you don't complete them on the application package, we will be contacting you. Um, those items of importance are the DUNS number, the employee identification number. Um, failure to include this information will result in triage of your application because they are required by the federal government when we send it in for review. Um, if you don't know these items or don't know what they are, um, you can definitely contact our office to find out what they are, but your, someone in your finance department of your institution should know what those numbers are and be able to provide those for you. Um, 
This is required to be signed off on by the principal investigator from the, um, so if you have more than one principal investigator, it's the principal, principal investigator from the lead institution, whoever the applicant institution is, as well as the authorized um, signing official for that organization. Again, if you don't know who that person is, someone from your finance department um, should be able to provide you with that name. Um, and if you are looking at doing a multiple PI approach, which we'll get into a little further in the discussion, um, we will need information for both principal investigators on this cover page. However, only one institution will need to sign off on that. Um, and then under site locations, again, we get into a little more of the details. The DUNS number um, and the zip code plus four, again, these are all required, um, required information that, that we need for NIH. Um, when we send this in for their review. Um, not including that information will result in triage of your application. So if you have questions on what that is, where to find that information within your institution, we'd be more than happy to help you um, navigate that path. The next part is the um, project descriptions. Um, the project abstract, you want to look at stating the broad long-term objectives of the, of the specific aims. Um, it's very important to reference the impact on the American Indian health in this section. Um, and do not exceed 500 words for that section. Second section there is the project narrative. Um, this should be generalizable to a lay audience. So anyone who is non, a non-scientist should be able to read this and understand what your project is. Um, there should be a relevance to public health list in this section, um, and we're looking at about three to five sentences for that. Biographical sketches. So we're looking at, we call these bio sketches. Um, they are required for all key personnel, so principal investigators, um, co-investigators if you're considering them key personnel. Um, it is optional if you want to include them for significant contributors, so if you have collaborators or um, people that you think are significant to the project but maybe not to the point of being a key personnel um, and you want us to be able to see the bio sketches or review committee to be able to see the bio sketches, you can definitely include it for those people as well. Um, we are using the old NIH format, the new format is out, um, but we are going by the four page format um, that includes the education, personal statement, position and honors, and peer reviewed publications um, as well as your res research support. Um, the template for that is at the back of the application package, and if you have questions on that, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, again, the page limit on that is four pages per person, and they should be included in the Appendix A. The Facilities, Equipment, and Resources page, um, we're, looking at, we're looking for you to identify the facilities and equipment already available for this project. So items that you won't be including in the grant application but are currently available for your study. So this is important because if someone's reading your study or your project and they don't um, see that you budgeted for a certain component of it, they want to make sure that you ha have that um, available to, to complete your project. Um, we do need a facilities and resource and equipment page for every site location. Um, and the site locations should be um, anywhere that the PI resides, so the institution for the principal investigators, and any um, other field work or site that maybe you're going into a tribal institution or a tribal area or any other site. And so you could have three, four, five different areas that you're providing facilities resources page on. And there is no page limit for that section. Research strategy is made up of four different sections. Um, we would just ask that you use the appropriate section headings on that. The sections are specific aims, significance, and in innovation and approach. Um, and those sections should not exceed six pages. Um, and within that, the specific aims cannot exceed one page. Um, you should cite all of your relevant work within the research strategy section, however full references should be provided in the references cited section. Um, as we just discussed, oh. so for tips on writing the content um, of your pilot application, 
you can look at the writing resources listed in the RFA on page 13. Um, and there's also a webinar, um, Tips on Writing a Pilot Grant, that was done by the Kirka team, um, Danielle. And that is available on the Kirka website at the link listed on the slide. Um, as previously mentioned, the references um, for relevant work should be included, the full references should be included in the research strategy section. Um, although no specific format is required for this section, we just ask that you be consistent that all references are formatted the same way. Um, and again, there's no page limit for that section. Human subjects. Um, there are several sections related to the human subjects. All research projects involving human subjects must complete sections A through F. Um, this section is required for, I would say, the majority of our application, or our applicants. Um, additional information and a link detailing the requirements for each section is provided on pages 9 to 10 of the RFA. Um, there's quite a bit of information provided out there. Um, again, if you have questions, you can feel free to contact um, Danielle or our office and we can provide a little bit of guidance on that as well. Um, keep in mind that the plan enrollment form must be completed in its entirety. Um, and failure to complete the human subject section will result in triage of your application. Um, there is no page limit for the human subject section. Institutional review board approval um, is required prior to the start of your project. If you have approvals currently for your project, um, please include those in Appendix C. Um, <coughs> And on the application, there is a section asking for the name of the Institutional Review Board. Um, and we ask that we have a spot for one listed on the application, but typically these projects are having two, three, four. We just ask that you copy and paste that section for each um, IRB that you'll be utilizing, as we will need the um, IRB name, the IRB number, the FWA numbers for all of those. Um, if you have questions on who you think maybe needs to be included, who will have to complete IRB, you can contact the Regu Regulatory Knowledge Corps or um, email the info at kirka.org um, address and they will get you to the right contact. But that section again is required, um, required by NIH for us to complete and those numbers um, should be available by the IRB if you have questions on how to obtain those. The next section um, is the tribal approvals, and this is related um, to the Institutional Review Board approvals. So again, if they've already been obtained, please include a copy in Appendix C. Um, but each tribe as a sovereign nation has their own process of approval. So any tribal pro approvals that are needed for the tribal nation that you're working with um, will need to be obtained, not necessarily at this point, but before you are able to spend your award, before the final notice of award will be issued. So some appropriate tribal approvals are like tribal council resolution are required. Um, official award, award letters won't be released until then. Um, and again, after the um, you've been notified that you're awarded, you can work with Regulatory Knowledge Corps either now or later to ensure um, that the appropriate approvals are in place. So if you choose to submit an application with multiple principal investigators, a multiple principal, principal investigator leadership plan will be required. Um, this includes providing a description of why you chose to use the multiple PI approach. Um, describing the governance and organization structure of the leadership team. So who is responsible for completing what? Um, and then delineating the roles and administrative, technical, and scientific responsibilities for the project. Um, if there's differences, who's going to resolve those? Um, just addressing how that whole leadership team will work. Um, there's additional instructions available in the RFA on page 10, um, and there are no page limits for this section. And to go into a little more detail, because people may be wondering what is a principal investigator, what is a co-principal investigator, and what is a co-investigator, um, we gave a little bit of definition here. Um, so a principal investigator is a project leader with a scientific, fiscal, and administrative responsibility for the project. Um, this person is the 
applicant entity, so there we will you would submit through this person's institution. Um, you can have a co-principal investigator, which basically has the same duties, um, but they are not the applicant entity. So in some cases, you are working on multi-site projects and you have someone who has the same responsibilities at another site. So then the two principal investigators would decide which application, which applicant entity would be the best to submit this application. Um, a co-investigator um, is someone who is involved in the scientific portion of the project, not necessarily in an administrative side of it. So they have a significant role in the scientific portion um, and they would most likely be listed as key personnel on the grant as well. Many, if not all, of the applications will involve consortium or contractual arrangements. Um, so here we want to, in this section, we want to explain the programmatic, fiscal, and administrative arrangements to be made between the applicant organization and the consortium organization. So basically what we're looking for is why are you working with this organization and what is their role going to be? Um, if you have consortium or contractual agreements in place already, please include them in Appendix B. Um, again, there is no page limit for the section and there are more details available on page 10 of the RFA where you can contact us if you're interested in learning more about what's required in that section. Letters of support are mandatory from, from the collaborating organizations. So not including a letter of support from your collaborating organization will result in triage of your application. Um, these letters should outline their commitment to the project and not just a general support of the project. So we want them to say what are they actually committing to the project um, and not just write a letter saying I support your project. Um, for consultants, when you do letters of support from consultants, please have them include their rate or charge for consulting services in their letters as that's a requirement um, of NIH. And all letters of support should be included in Appendix B. There is no limit to the number that you can include. However, all of them, uh, letters from collabor collaborating organizations are mandatory. The next section is the resource sharing plan or data management plan. Um, we're just looking for you to provide a detailed explanation of how the data will be collected, analyzed, and interpreted. Um, provide a brief one paragraph description of how the final research data will be shared or explain why data sharing is not possible in that section. And on to budget. So this is a slide that Danielle talked about a little earlier. Um, the project period for this cycle is August 1st of this year through July 31st of next year. We're looking for applications with total direct costs between $25,000 and $80,000. Um, and that does not include the applicant organization's IDC or indirect cost rate. However, consortium's indirect costs are included in that direct cost um, request of $25,000 to $80,000. Yeah, so the sub-awards, if you have a sub-award um, on, on your grant, then their indirect costs are included in your total direct costs, but your institution's direct costs are not included in that direct cost rate. A little confusing. If there's questions on it, please contact our office, and we can definitely walk you through that. So this year, we have um, made a change in chosen to go with the PHS 398 forms for our budget pages. Um, so there may be some questions if you haven't um, worked with the federal forms before and we would be more than happy to walk you through that. I'll go through a little of it today, um, but again, feel free to contact us. Um, we're Under personnel, we're looking um, to include all personnel involved in the project. So include the amount of time you're dedicating to the project and the amount that you're requesting for that person. We want all people listed on the budget page regardless of whether or not you're requesting funding. So if you're cost sharing someone on the project, we still want their name listed and a zero dollar amount put on there because we want to know what that percent effort that they're um, requesting is and we want them included in the justification so we know what their role on the project is as well. Um, materials and supplies includes um, items like 
office supplies, postage, communication, um, lab or medical supplies. Computers are allowable only if they're going to be used 100% of the time for this project, and that is a NIH mandate. Um, travel to Native American communities is allowable. Um, travel for project meetings and training is allowable. That's probably about the only travel that we would allow in the project. Um, travel to national meetings is not an allowable cost. Unpaid research, co unpaid research costs for projects for um, inpatients, such as lab, tests, x-rays, imaging, things that are not considered standard of care are allowable costs, and that would go under that inpatient, outpatient care cost section. Um, another section on the budget page is alterations and renovations, with, which is an unallowable cost for this program. And then other expenses um, can be an array of different things, um, but anything that's not listed in any of the above categories. So for example, food for focus groups, um, community advisors, participant incentives um, would all go under the other expenses section. And please note that publication costs are not allowable under this RFA. And then on that budget page, that 398 budget page, we're just asking you to insert the total direct and indirect costs for the consortium as well. Um, in the budget justification, we're looking at you. We're looking for you to provide a detailed budget for all the costs. Um, be sure to identify the role of each person involved in the project and the percent effort they're committing on it. Um, provide a brief statement of work for each consortium or contractual arrangement, um, and we'll go over a detailed budget for those consortium or sub awards um, here in a few minutes. Um, and there is no page limitation for the budget section. So facilities and administrative costs or indirect costs, um, always a question of debate. Um, so these are overhead costs incurred by your organizations, um, which are difficult to itemize or charge directly to individual projects. So a lot of organizations have F&A um, or indirect cost rate. Um, several don't as well. So if you do not have institutions that do not have an F&A rate, um, and do not want to negotiate one particularly just for this grant, um, can use a 10% indirect cost rate. Um, if you have a negotiated rate with your organization, you can list your full negotiated rate on the application. Um, if you're requesting the facilities and administrative costs, the appropriate section in the application package must be completed. Um, and if you don't know if you have an F&A rate or what it is, um, you can contact your business office, your finance person, um, or your grants office if you have a grants office, and they should be able to help you identify what that is. I alluded to it a little bit before, but each um, sub-award or consortium must have its own budget and budget justification page. And I believe that is on page, if you haven't started typing into the application package yet, it is on page 10 of the application package. Um, we put in a spot for one sub-award or one um, contractual consortium arrangement. If you have more than one, we would just ask before you start to complete this that you copy and paste that section for however many sub-awards you're going to have on your project. Because we will need a separate form for each entity that you're working with on the project. Um, again, the, the consortium or sub-award direct and indirect costs must be included in your total direct costs of submitting the application. And these, are, these details are listed on page 11 of the RFA. Um, again, no um, page limitation for the budget or budget justification component. The next section is the appendices. Um, so Appendix A should be all the biographical sketches that you have, um, key personnel or other significant personnel. Appendix B should be any consortium or contractual arrangements you have or any of your letters of support or letters of commitment. Your tribal and partner letters that are required should be entered into this section. Um, and Appendix C would be any publications, um, surveys, questionnaires, or other data collection instruments, clinical protocols, um, informed consents, IRB approvals, tribal approvals, um, 
anything else that you think would be relevant for us to review for the project? And then application submission, um, the deadline is 5 o'clock Central Standard Time on February 10th. Um, we stick hard to that one minute late and you will not be accepted. It will be triaged. So please remember 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, um, February 10th is our deadline. And they should be submitted to um, research grants at SanfordHealth.org. And you will, re you will receive email confirmation upon submission. And I think we're ready for questions. And just to note that um, triage means thrown out, so it won't be reviewed by your external review committee. So, and we hate, that's very painful, we do not want to triage any grants. Um, so please um, get your questions answered and make sure all of those um, relevant parts are filled out. Um, just a couple of um, clarifications before we start with questions. Um, on the targeted enrollment table that was referenced, all the cells need to be filled. So if there's nothing that you put there, please put a zero in those items. Um, don't leave the little, any little dash or space. And then a note on the travel um, that Tabitha outlined the limitations on travel, traveling for communities, meetings, um, no travel to national meetings, but we would encourage you to budget $1,000 in to travel to the Kirka Summit. So um, if you are awarded the grant, we highly encourage you to um, submit for a presentation at the summit. So um, if you can include that in your budget, we would encourage that. All right, we have a few questions. Um, one of the questions is how much technical support is provided when it comes to analyzing data? For example, calculating ANOVA. Yeah, I think that's, um, so those questions go to the methodology core and the person listed uh, in the RFA is Susan Pumala and um, Chad Berger um, would also be able to answer that question. I think our cores, it's a really great question because it's kind of like what's the limitation or time investment from our cores? They're able to help out as much time um, as they have and we have different priorities of prioritizing our tribal partners' needs and our pilot grant applicant and um, awardee needs and then other partners, um, kind of in that order. And I would think that something like um, help with calculating in ANOVA, um, trying to figure out what variables to use, setting up your statistical analyses would definitely be in um, their purview of helping. Now actually like sending them the data to run it for you, that's where I think the line would be drawn. Um, where they've drawn it in the past, um, that they are one of the friendliest folks that will be willing to uh, chat with you and even as you're like um, figuring out how the program works and um, doing your, your analyses, I bet they would be um, happy to talk with you over the phone or sit with you while you do that. So if that makes sense and um, if you would um, connect with them, um, we'd be happy to continue that conversation or if there's other questions about that too, where the line is when you're asking for core assistance, um, please just reach out to them and they'll let you know. Another related question is, do we need to purchase statistical analysis software as a part of our equipment? I guess that depends if it's needed for the project. Um, you would have to justify in your budget justification that there's a reason because some of the software gets pretty expensive and because this is a one-year pilot grant, um, that might get a little tricky if you want to purchase, you know, I don't know how much they are, $10,000 software, um, might be hard to justify. So it really just depends if you think you're able to justify it enough to the reviewers that that's a responsible way to spend your money. Um, anything else to add? Mm -hmm. So. So again, if you have a question on that, our grants office or um, shooting an email to Methodology or myself would be happy to help you make that judgment call. And if you don't have the resources available to do the data analysis and you're looking, um, rather than buying the software and looking at someone to help um, complete those data analyses for you, we can definitely put you in touch with someone that you can maybe write into the grant as an alternative to buying the software. All right, next question is, what if an organization doesn't have a negotiated indirect cost rate? We usually do 10%, but it's not a formal negotiated rate. Do we have to have one? 
No, NIH now has a rule that you can, if you do not have a negotiated cost rate, you can use a 10% um, rate in their application. So we are abiding by that 10%. And they wouldn't have to put it in if they didn't want to, if it's a sub-award, because that would come off their direct costs. Correct. That would be the applicant entity's call. We would not require them to put that 10% in. If the applicant entity wants to keep those direct costs, they can say no, they can't have indirect. Next question. Can we get a copy of these slides? Yes. Um, you can. The, the whole presentation should be posted to the website in the next week. Um, so probably early next week, hopefully. Um, the whole thing will be on the web. Is three to five sentences correct for the project narrative or should it be pages? Sentences. They're just looking, we're just looking for a very, very brief overview of the project. So two, three to five sentences is correct. Next question is, our project will serve an urban Indian population that includes both participants who qualify for tribal enrollment and AI identifying people who do not. We are located in Minneapolis, not on tribal land. Do we need tribal IRB approval from tribes whose members may participate or no? So that's kind of a touchy um, question that I I would defer to our regulatory knowledge core um, to really sort that out because it depends. Um, you're also within the Bemidji area, um, I, IRB approval. So what I would do right now, of course, you don't need any um, approvals, but in that section for um, IRB and tribal approvals, I would put what you think you need. Um, and and maybe reach out to the regulatory knowledge core. If you are awarded, they would definitely be pursuing that question with you. Can the personnel change once the award is given? For example, if I have a consultant that's no longer able to help, can I find someone else? As long as you don't list them as key personnel, yes. If they're listed as key personnel, then that would have to go through a prior approval process. But if they are just listed on the grant as a consultant um, and not as key personnel, yes, that person can change as long as they're providing the same service. All right. It looks like that's all the questions that I have so far. We'll wait another minute for any questions to come through. and So please type any questions in that you have at this time. Um, otherwise, as we've stated several times, we are more than happy to answer questions at any time and um, with the time that's provided. So if, if we can stress even one more time that um, the due date is February 10th, um, 5 o'clock Central Time um, to the Research Grants Office. The email that is on the screen right now, researchgrants at sanfordhealth.org and their direct phone line is there. And then the Kirka office phone line is 605-312-6232, um, email info at kirka.org. All right. Well, with that, um, we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your time and interest in the Kirka Pilot Grants Program. Um, we really appreciate your interest in the program and hope to receive your applications very soon.